when we look at what's in the cancer population, we see that muscle loss is associated with a variety of negative outcomes. So we need to use nutrition to support maintaining your muscle. And that we also see in like cancer cachexia, a really advanced stage of malnutrition, the tumor is still growing, whether that individual is eating or not. It's an example that the cancer is going to get the fuel regardless of what you're doing with your diet. And it will often do it at the sacrifice of, of the individual. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. In today's conversation, I sit down with Dr. Crystal Zuniga. The focus of the conversation being directed towards evidence-based nutrition recommendations during cancer treatment. As a board-certified oncology dietitian with a PhD in nutrition science and owner of a private practice and social media account, Cancer Nutrition HQ, Dr. Zuniga strives to combat misinformation, share the latest research in nutrition and cancer, and translate the science into everyday actions cancer survivors can take to support their health and quality of life with nutrition. Please enjoy. To kind of kick us off here, you've uh, dedicated your professional life to helping cancer survivors both um, during and after treatment manage their nutrition. Why this area of of health and this area of science? What is it about nutrition and cancer that sort of gives meaning to to what you do? Yeah, well, nutrition is a very exciting field to be in to begin with. But really what I enjoy about working with the cancer population is really the complexity of working with these individuals. Um, I really like clinical nutrition and we see a lot of that, all of it really in oncology. So I find it intellectually really challenging, but it is also very rewarding. And I learned so much from working with the cancer population. And I think that as our conversation will probably have today, there are so many unknowns. And it is really exciting to be up with the research, see what's up and coming, to see how we can use nutrition to support people during a very challenging part of their life. So it's very rewarding, intellectually stimulating, and there's so many unknowns. So it's really exciting to try to keep up with all of the research. And what's your, I guess, career path sort of look like to date? I know that there's both a a sort of a clinical aspect with patients, but then also an academic um, side of side of the equation as well. Sure. Uh, My career path, I did my undergraduate degree with dietetics, thinking I wanted to be a dietitian. And then I did one research experience as an undergrad, which was looking at how um, a compound in pomegranates was affecting prostate cancer cells. And that really opened up my mind to just how powerful nutrition could be. So I got my PhD in nutritional sciences and was doing research on dietary interventions in prostate cancer uh, using whole food interventions. Um, And then I kind of have a long career path or windy path, I like to say, but I did a postdoc um, in the Department of Kinesiology and learned a lot about physical activity in relation to cancer survivorship. Did my dietetic internship. I was in academia doing some research and teaching, but I was really missing just going all in with clinical. So I did work in an outpatient oncology clinic for um, a little over a couple of years. A lot of it was during COVID. So that was definitely a different experience. And now I am back in academia, doing private practice, getting a whole lot of blend of what I really love about nutrition. I love the education piece, uh, but that includes educating future healthcare providers as well as educating patients and survivors. So uh, yeah, a little bit of a windy path. It went into academia, left for a little bit, came back in a different way. And how do you think, I guess, we're going as a, um, a nutrition community, a scientific community, in terms of getting the right information to patients with cancer versus um, potentially, I guess, misinformation or disinformation that could be confusing or, or even, I guess, harming individuals? 
Yeah. You know, and being involved, seeing social media grow, I was just seeing a lot of misinformation show up on Instagram. And then in working with patients, then bringing information to me, I was like, wow, I have never heard of that before. Where are you hearing this information? And I was just seeing that there's a lot of harmful misinformation out there as well. You know, information telling people to not choose treatment and to use natural or alternative approaches. And I think we do have a long way to go in getting the right information out to these individuals. Um, people are making decisions about their health based on information they're finding online, which is not fact checked and can be truly harmful. So I did start getting on social media and trying to communicate some of this information because unfortunately, uh, there is there are reputable resources out there, but it's not getting to the people who need it. Uh, so we do have a very long way to go. And urgently, I think we need to get there. Yeah, and I, I guess this patient population is in some ways particularly vulnerable, I guess, to misinformation. There's there's often a lot of urgency and there's fear and there's a sense of unknown. So what do you feel are, if you were just to list at a high level, what are, what are the kind of most frequent pieces or buckets of misinformation or damaging pieces of misinformation that you would see in this space? Yeah, I think one of the big buckets is that diet alone could cure their cancer. And I think that is probably the most harmful piece of misinformation because you're delaying someone getting evidence-based treatments right? and going some natural route, which ultimately is letting their cancer progress. So that is a big bucket. And there's a lot of that out there. Um, and then I'd say another bucket of misinformation is a lot of exclusionary foods. Like if you have cancer, you shouldn't be eating this. You shouldn't be eating this. And then I often get patients who are like, I have no idea what to eat. And already they're scared about their diagnosis. Now they're scared about what they have to do every day, multiple times a day. Uh, so that's a big bucket of misinformation about foods they need to exclude from their diet or a certain diet that they need to follow uh, during cancer. And then a lot of stuff about supplements and all these magical things that supplements can do. So then also people are purchasing things that don't have research behind them and also could be interfering with the safety and efficacy of their treatments. So big buckets, but all of the buckets have a level of harm in different ways. Yeah, we might come back. We'll revisit a few of those, I'm sure, as, as we progress through this. In my book, I wrote, food is not medicine per se. And <laughs> I, I don't think that's hugely controversial, but it does run a little bit counter, I guess, to a lot of the messaging in the in the wellness um, world. And it wasn't re it wasn't a flippant statement that I was making. It was something that I had spent a lot of time thinking about. What's your take on this idea of of food as medicine or food is medicine? I seem to have the same philosophy as you that food is a very powerful tool. But health is so much more complex than just nutrition. Right? And it's giving too much power to food. Like, yes, food is a very powerful tool and being adequately nourished um, and having a healthful diet can have many health benefits. But saying that food is medicine often gets translated into people thinking that food is an alternative to medicine. And it is not working in the same way. It's not working through uh, those same mechanisms. It's powerful, but we have to, I did a post about this too before, is like to really truly respect the power of nutrition. You respect what it can and cannot do. And also, I don't say that with a flippant regard either. In studying nutrition, I know the power of it, but also know really big limitations. What would it take, I guess, for you, or, and I guess I'm asking myself this question, to kind of actually see food as medicine? Would it be a clinical trial that put some sort of dietary intervention, specific dietary intervention up against a something like chemotherapy or, or whatever that was proven and led to better survival rates? Do you think in that instance, then all of a sudden that dietary intervention could be considered a form of medicine or would you still see it as, as distinct? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't think we'll ever have a trial like that. Um, there is an example of a trial like that that did diet versus 
uh, conventional chemotherapy and it did not work out well. Uh, but for example, like the DASH diet, right, the dietary approach to stop hypertension, that was uh, testing a diet alone and seeing how it could impact uh, blood pressure. And it was very powerful, uh, the impact of diet. But I think maybe what I would like to see is that we see diet and treatment compared to treatment alone and seeing more significant benefits. And then uh, it's like, well, I wouldn't say it's medicine. It is an adjunct to medicine. So in terms of us kind of um, creating a, a scaffold for this conversation, so your position is that nutrition is powerful, it's really important, and when you have cancer, there are certain aspects of your nutrition that you want to focus on based on changing of, of uh, nutrient requirements and potential nutrient status during that period? Yes, absolutely. We do know that uh, diet recommendations do change during cancer treatment. The body has different needs as it's going through cancer treatment. And so we can't utilize manipulation of the diet to help optimize the health of the individual, help optimize healing and recovery, improve quality of life. So nutrition yeah, can definitely be used as a tool to help support an individual during treatment. Why do you think that a lot of this misinformation and fear mongering exists? Is it, is it simply a playbook to, to kind of sell things? Is, it, is that really what it all boils down to? Now, as you had mentioned earlier, this is a very vulnerable population. Uh, cancer treatment is scary. Having I mean, cancer is scary. Cancer treatments are scary and a lot of their side effects. So people are absolutely vulnerable to trying to find something that feels safer and not as scary. I think that is an opportunity for people to make money. If they're like, well, we can offer an alternative that sounds less scary. We can offer more support. We can explain it in a way that makes more sense to them than maybe what they're hearing from their oncologist or in their um, healthcare team. So I think that there are people, I, th I think there is some harm <laughs> that they're, they don't maybe understand how much harm they are doing. But I do believe it is for financial gain. But also to try and error, like maybe there are people who truly do believe this and truly believe that diet alone can cure cancer and they want people to jump on that train. But I kind of lean on the side of this is a very vulnerable population who is looking for help and these people are offering that help. Right. Yeah, they might they might be convinced, but they they may just not be aware of I guess some of the biases that that could be at play there that could be skewing their view of a particular intervention, say some sort of juice detox or a particular diet. I always think about if you jump onto um, some sort of social media page that's touting the specific benefits of, of some sort of um, natural alternative therapy that hasn't been tested in a, in a clinical setting, I always think about the fact that, you know, firstly, while some of this can be interesting and, and sort of hypothesis generating, it's not validated. So if Simon jumps on and sort of shares his story about, you know, I had prostate cancer or something and I did a particular juice cleanse and I became prostate cancer free. Well, the first thing is, uh, and I don't want to sort of invalidate anyone's experience, but we have no way of validating, did Simon actually have prostate cancer at the start? Was the diagnosis accurate? Um, we have no idea as to all of the other things that he was potentially doing in his life. And we have no idea of knowing for every Simon that exists how many Stevens and Marks and Michaels did the same thing and had a really bad outcome who could have gone down another path with a proven therapy and had a much better outcome. So we can sometimes, I think, get caught up in the anecdote and, and sort of lose sight of the real reason for the scientific method and the importance of having clinical trials, whether you're looking at a drug or you're looking at a natural therapy. Absolutely. I think you summed that up very well, that these anecdotes can be really powerful and sound promising. And maybe when they're talking to their healthcare provider or looking up things online, it's numbers, it's statistics. Right? And that's not as powerful maybe as hearing a story about someone who had 
as cancer and it was cured, but when there's really no way of validating that that happened. Um, and I know that there are, um, it's actually, I forget her name, but she was someone based in Australia who was touting uh, her diet as a cure to her cancer and she never had cancer. Yeah, I remember that. There was a, I think that might have been uh, a young influencer from memory. It ended up in the the media. It was quite quite the story at the time. Um, and it actually makes me think that p- potentially uh, it could be quite powerful to, to get some qualitative information from clinical trials and stories from within clinical trials um, to, and, and use those as a way of um, giving people a bit more of a, a feel or connection to the person. Um, because you're right, that's where the anecdote online does sort of you know draw people in. They, they can relate to that. It's, it can be difficult to relate to you know, just the outcomes of a study, the the numbers that we see. And I've heard from, you know, patients who go on, they're looking for support and they go into these support groups and they're hearing a lot of anecdotes of supplements to take, diets to try. And sometimes a lot of that information is coming from, misinformation is coming from their own community um, and right, not maybe discussing about, well, I was also on this therapy or I didn't have the same dose as you did. So, you know, they're attributing, maybe not having side effects, to a supplement, but they might have been on a different dose and regimen of that therapy. What are we seeing, I guess, um, in developed countries you know, ar- around the world in terms of cancer incidents and the types of cancers that people are getting? Is this something that's that's been changing a lot? Have we have we seen the survival rates improving? Are we seeing more people get cancer, less people get cancer? Uh, survival here in the U.S. is improving. Um, and a lot of that is related to there's less lung cancer, uh, less uh, lung cancer um, incidence has been on the decline, but we are seeing an increase in more cancers that are related to obesity, like pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, a colorectal cancer. Uh, so there is changes going on in the types of cancer that are becoming more prevalent. Um, one thing of concern is the increasing rate of colorectal cancer in young adults, too. We're seeing a decline in older adults, but an increase in the younger adult uh, population. Not quite sure what's going on there. There's definitely a lot of active investigation into why, but it's shifting. So today we're, we're going to zoom in on uh, nutrition to support cancer treatment. Um, but before we get there, I guess, broadly speaking, is the nutrition advice that you would typically give for a cancer patient similar to what you would give to someone who didn't have cancer that wanted to eat in a way that lowered their risk of cancer? Oh, that's a good question. It, it kind of depends on the cancer type. There are some cancer types where we need to be much more focused on higher calorie, high protein. Um, that's a general recommendation. Like, let's talk about the impact of cancer treatments. Uh, most common therapy that people receive is chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is a systemic treatment. It is not just damaging cancer cells. We also see healthy cells uh, being damaged. So the individual is going to need more protein, more calories to help those healthy cells recover so that that individual is ready for the next round of treatment. Um, And I'd say during treatment, I'm much less concerned about, did you get all five servings of fruits and vegetables that day? It's did you get adequate calories and protein in that day? Because if you did not, what's going to happen? We're going to see muscle loss. And this is particularly concerning in the cancer population. There is strong body of evidence that shows that muscle loss during treatment is associated with poor survival, poor outcomes, more treatment toxicities. So a priority during treatment is to try to maintain weight, maintain muscle. Um, so kind of broad stroke there, but that is what's most important during treatment. Now, absolutely, if they can meet their calorie and protein needs with a variety of plant-based foods, that's great. But that priority really needs to be getting adequate nutrition to support the body going through these really challenging treatments. Okay. So there's an increased um, energy requirement during cancer treatment. Would that be fair to to say? Um, an increased importance of protein for a variety of reasons, I I presume, for the immune system, but specifically as well for 
preserving muscle, um, there is an increased need or requirement for certain micronutrients. Would that also be fair to say? So we don't have as much research about what particular micronutrients might be uh, needed in higher amounts. Um, that's a challenge there about the micronutrients needs, but there is going to be a little more you know, cell turnover. So it might need more B12 right, or iron as we're getting more red blood cells that need to be made because they got suppressed by the chemotherapy. Do, do patients, and this is just from what I've uh, read and then also speaking with some people, do patients often undergoing cancer treatment have a reduction in appetite um, or changes in sort of nutrient absorption? And does that sort of pose increased challenges here where the nutrient requirement's going up, but they're actually finding it even more difficult to, to kind of consume enough food and enough nutrients? Absolutely. It's a perfect setup for malnutrition. And it is estimated that up to 60 to 80% of patients with cancer will be malnourished at some point during their cancer treatment. And this is important because it is estimated that up to 20% of cancer deaths are due to malnutrition, directly related to malnourishment. Um, so yes, we have this challenge of increased needs with side effects that are impacting not only their appetite, but also the way foods taste. Um, some people get mouth sores, so it's painful to eat, diarrhea, malabsorption. So if they are able to eat, the nutrients aren't being absorbed and assimilated as well. So there are a lot of challenges to keep up with those increased nutrient needs. And this is a very high risk uh, population for malnutrition, and it should be addressed as soon as possible to get that nutrition support um, to address that malnutrition. How do you recommend, I guess, if you're working with a patient, um, how would you recommend someone sort of navigates this space if they're thinking, well, I don't actually even know how many, <laughs> how many calories or how much food I actually need to consume. And I understand protein is important and I have a vague idea of where you can get protein, but how much protein do I need? Is there any sort of um, way or framework that you could offer someone to help navigate that? Sure. So broadly, uh, recommendations for protein are one to one and a half grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Uh, for those um, experiencing more weight loss or have advanced in the stage of cancer cachexia, we're looking at much higher, like two to two and a half grams uh, per kilogram of body weight. So much higher needs. And then energy wise, it's like, well, I don't expect people to be micromanaging and counting their calories. I mean, all of these equations are all estimates anyway. Uh, it's more of, well, if you're losing weight, you need more than what you're consuming now and uh, try to get as many calories as you can in rather than spending. There's already a lot on their plate um, to say, okay, I'm, I'm losing weight. I need to add in more calories in my diet, more energy in my diet and preferably coming from protein rich foods. And maybe we can break that down. So there's probably some uh, confusion and lots of ideas out there around what kind of sources of protein people should and, and shouldn't eat. And maybe there's some um, exaggerations or fear created over certain foods that, that might not be necessary. How would you help someone understand what that means from a food perspective when they're at the grocery store or putting together a meal? Of consuming more protein, uh, I give the general guidance of and we don't need to count every gram and you don't need to micromanage and look at every label, but to aim to have a protein rich food at every meal and snack. And so I'll discuss what are foods that contain protein. Ideally, would like to look for uh, more things like poultry, fish, beans, legumes, uh, tofu, edamame, having a variety there. Um, if someone is losing a lot of weight, I'm not going to put the restrictions on red meat, but if someone is doing okay and we just need to reach protein, we try to still limit red meat and processed meat as well. But I like to set up of what that should look like on your plate and just aim to have protein every meal and snack. It will add up throughout the day. And sometimes using a protein supplement, a protein powder can be a really easy way to get that additional 
protein, especially when appetites are low and your taste changes. Smoothies are pretty magical in that um, you can make it taste like whatever you want. You've got liquid calories, drink it through a straw, things taste weird. If you've got mouth sores, it's going to go down easier too. So uh, I don't, there is a lot of fear about using protein supplements. And if I'm not trying to get you to be like a bodybuilder and having multiple protein supplements a day, but we're looking at this as a tool to really help you meet those higher protein needs. And that this is a short term strategy right now. Ultimately, when you are feeling better, appetites better, we can rely more on foods, but it is okay to utilize these supplements in the short term to meet those nutrient needs. I think some of that fear that people may have around protein is information that they, they could have come across that suggests that eating more protein is going to increase IGF-1 levels and then this increases risk of cancer. I'm sure you've seen that. I'm sure people have sent you a message saying, um, in fact, should I should I restrict protein to limit my chance of getting cancer or once I have cancer to increase my um, chances of survival? Um, how would you sort of recommend someone thinks about that area of science and and why is it that you take a bit of a different position where you say well actually no it's actually quite important to plan for and if anything emphasize protein in the diet during cancer treatment rather than restricting it right so we look at like mechanism wise short igf1 levels um there are igf1 receptors on some cancer cells and that's going to stimulate growth right but i feel like where we have that human evidence and a strong body of evidence is that muscle loss and that muscle loss being associated with a variety of more negative outcomes, including survival. So that's our focus, right? We want someone to survive from their cancer and not have toxicities and not have frequent hospitalizations. So maintaining muscle is going to require protein. That's just the fact of it, is that we need that protein. And also, of course, we want to incorporate resistance training if we can. So it's, it's outweighing that of, okay, yes, there's this mechanistic work or associations, but when we look at within the cancer population, we see that muscle loss is associated with a variety of negative outcomes. So we need to use nutrition to support maintaining your muscle. Um, and that we also see in like cancer cachexia, a really advanced stage of malnutrition, the tumor is still growing, whether that individual is eating or not. It's an example that the cancer is going to get the fuel regardless of what you're doing with your diet. And it will often do it at the sacrifice of, of the individual. So I like to outweigh like, yes, there's mechanism stuff, but let's look at what's actually happening in this population. So there's, there's obviously um, a clear reason for doing what you can with your nutrition and lifestyle to preserve muscle and you you spoke before about we we really want to um, avoid sort of un, unintentional weight loss which could occur during cancer treatment what about for the patient who is potentially under muscled but has excessive adiposity does that excessive adiposity change their their outcomes and their sort of uh, risk of, of or um, chances of survival. And are we, in that instance, are we looking at trying to preserve muscle and lose body fat? What would the, the goal for that patient be? Unfortunately, this is an area of research that we, is very early. Um, there has been one completed trial in ovarian cancer uh, with using intentional weight loss. The results have not come out from that study. And there's another study going on right now in breast cancer uh, using intentional weight loss, and it is going to look at outcomes, but that study is still underway. Um, all of our research right now does suggest that weight loss is associated with more negative outcomes. Unfortunately, because it's just observational stuff, we don't know if that weight loss was intentional or not. I think we can assume that's unintentional weight loss, and then that's associated with uh, negative outcomes. So it's a really tricky place to be to recommend intentional weight loss while going through cancer treatment, especially when we know that even an intentional weight loss, there's muscle loss 
right? Even the best, and you've got to do good resistance training and even more protein to try to preserve as much of that muscle as possible when going through intentional weight loss. Um, and then we have that additional factor of what's going on during cancer treatment is a lot of systemic inflammation. So that makes it even more challenging to try to preserve muscle while pursuing intentional fat loss. So there, this is an unanswered question right now, and there is research underway to figure out if intentional weight loss would have a benefit during cancer treatment. Right. But at the moment, you're saying priority is when you're planning the nutrition is first and foremost, uh, enough energy to support you through the treatment, enough protein, um, resistance training, and, and like doing what you can to preserve uh, muscle mass, obviously planning to ensure you're not developing any nutrient deficiencies, so you're getting the, the variety of micronutrients that we need. Um, what about using nutrition to lessen um, side effects that could occur during cancer treatment. Is there anything that someone can do there? So as I've probably reiterated many times, yes, you know that uh, muscle loss is associated with more treatment toxicity, so more side effects. So again, yet another plug about maintaining muscle. But depending on the side effect, yes, there are dietary strategies that we could use to try to reduce the severity of uh, those side effects. A really common side effect is diarrhea. Um, so I ask all about stool and bowel movements a lot to these individuals, but we need to know because if there's diarrhea, that means that also these nutrients are not getting absorbed. They're, they're coming out and we're um, impacting the health of the intestine if it's pretty severe uh, diarrhea. So we can use things like incorporating more soluble fiber into the diet. And actually a review just came out um, last week, a systemic review and meta-analysis that found that a probiotic supplementation uh, being associated with reduced severity of radiation and chemotherapy-induced diarrhea. So we could use some supplementation around that. Constipation is also, a, yeah, very interesting, the probiotic effects. And especially when these trials were using different uh, types of probiotics. So unfortunately, we don't have, this is the type of bacteria uh, that you should be supplementing with. But broadly, yes, it's shown to be pretty positive for radiation and chemotherapy-induced diarrhea. And so um, people want to use anything that's really not another medication. It's like, well, chemotherapy is causing diarrhea. And, okay, now take uh, ammonium, and that'll help. Or constipation, here, take Senna. And it's just playing this game of balance when we can try to use diet and um, some strategies around that to minimize side effects without having to resort to medications for every side effect. You mentioned pomegranate earlier. And, and you were studying it. And uh, pomegranate is very rich in polyphenols. And it kind of gets me thinking about phytochemicals as a, uh, as a class, polyphenols, carotenoids, all that sort of stuff, in, in, particularly in, in colorful plants. And often the phrase and in literature and online that can be used um, here relative to cancer is anti-carcinogenic or anti-tumor sort of effects of a, a compound um, or a food. For example, one that comes to mind is sulforaphane in cruciferous vegetables, especially uh, broccoli, rich in broccoli sprouts. Is is there a problem with, with such phraseology saying that something's anti-carcinogenic or anti-tumor, or is that a, 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 a potentially quite fair um, description and, and, and way to discuss these foods and compounds. Yeah, I think it, it's only problematic if we start saying like, you have to take this because this is going to directly kill your cancer cells. Um, I like the phrase someone used the other day, it was like stack the deck, that we can try to incorporate more phytochemicals and that we're going to have more you know, compounds that are going to be helping the body try to reduce cancer cell growth. So yeah, there's so many phytochemicals that we're learning more about and, um, their specific oh, anti-cancer activity, and they do in animal models and in, in vitro um, can directly inhibit cell growth. So I think it's fair to call them anti-cancer. Now, how much of that needs to be consumed by the individual to have that same effect? No, we don't know. But I think exposing the body to as many of those phytochemicals as possible is only going to be beneficial. Okay, so you advocate for just diversity of those colorful um, foods. If someone's thinking, well, doc, 
just tell me what the top ones are. What are the the sort of quote unquote superfoods with specific anti cancer properties? Is that something that that exists or or territory that you would even go into? Oh well, if I'm really getting pushed about what it's like, I like all the vegetables and all the fruit. What can I really focus on? You hit on one, the cruciferous vegetables. Absolutely, when we think about just how much the liver is being stressed. Um, in metabolizing medications and chemotherapy, absolutely consuming something that helps with the liver's detox activity. I would support so cruciferous vegetables and uh, berries really high in antioxidants and a very low volume too. So when we're trying to get as much bang for our buck when someone has low appetite, um, emphasizing blueberries, blackberries, raspberries um, in the diet. I also really like to emphasize things like chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, um, Fiber content is going to support a healthy microbiome, uh, so really beneficial there. Also can be really calorically dense without having to consume a whole lot of them. And then we're right, lignans and um, polyunsaturated fats in these foods. They're all super. I love them, as you can see by this image here. All the variety of fruits and, and vegetables. But if I really got pushed of what to emphasize, I think those would be some really good places to start. Quick one, if you'd like some inspiration to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level, be sure to check out my digital plant-based ferments guide. Inside are some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labne and homemade kombucha. Learn more at theproof.com forward slash ferments. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. You mentioned the word detox there, and that gets me thinking this population probably is marketed with all sorts of detoxes and cleanses programs that people do so different to what you were just talking about which was i guess diet kind of supporting the liver and your own systems what would you like people to this population to know about some of these detoxes and cleanses that are sold or any of them worth exploring or should they just focus on the foods they're eating Oh, absolutely not worth exploring. There's quite a variety I, I have seen being presented. For example, charcoal was one that um, was pretty popular for a while. But yeah, charcoal is going to bind to things and get it out of the body, including the medications that you're taking. So that is not safe. Um, sometimes juicing is often advertised as something for uh, detoxing. And that can cause a lot of GI upset because they're very concentrated. It's replacing more nutrient dense foods that are providing protein and fiber and not just the juice of that fruit or vegetable and can sometimes make diarrhea worse, actually, because they are so concentrated, um, those fruit juices. And then when we start looking into supplements that are being promoted for detox activity, then we're really getting into a sketchy area of could those supplements actually be interfering with the metabolism of your therapeutic, making it either less effective or increasing the risk of uh, toxicities and side effects from your medication because this detox drink supplement, whatever, is interfering with enzymes in the liver that are responsible for <laughs> detox activity, including metabolism of your therapeutics. So I would say it is not worth that risk, and there is also no evidence to support that it would have any benefits. You mentioned fiber, and earlier you mentioned the probiotics that potentially could be beneficial for um, diarrhea during um, cancer treatment, which gets me thinking a bit more about the microbiome here, whether you're a fan of fermented foods, um, if there's something that people should be considering. And I guess more, more broadly here, you know, what is the, the potential role of the microbiome um, with regards to someone's um, cancer prognosis? And why is it something that I guess we should be thinking about from a, a nutrition perspective during this time? Oh, yeah, this is a very exciting area of research uh, that I've been seeing is tapping into seeing the uh, relationship between the microbiome and responses to therapy. And I think one I'm really excited about are some studies that have come out about immunotherapy and the response to immunotherapy for melanoma in relation to diet. So um, there's this group out at MD Anderson that has done this uh, research and found that those that had higher fiber diets had a better response, including better survival uh, from immunotherapy. 
And they also found that these individuals had a more diverse uh, microbiome than those that had a lower fiber diet. They also did a really cool um, study where they looked at the responders and the non-responders. And they actually did a fecal microbiome transplant from the responders into the a subset of non-responders. It's only, I think they ended up with only 15 individuals, but about six of them got a response when they previously were not responsive to immunotherapy. So this is really a great example of how the microbiome could be playing a role in how somebody responds to therapy. Uh, there is some also interesting research about the side effects of therapy. Uh, that there is, I'll give one specific example here. So arenotecan is a chemotherapeutic agent that's often used in GI related cancers. And it gets metabolized by the liver. And then uh, the liver or the metabolite of it gets excreted in, into the bile, into the intestine. Well, the bacteria there, some of them have activity to remove. So it gets glucuronidated in the liver and then gets excreted into the bile, into the intestine. Well, these bacteria have an enzyme that removes that. So then essentially it's making the drug active again. And so what happens is then we have the side effects and increased toxicities related to that drug. Um, so this is important to understand because arenotecan has a very high prevalence of, of diarrhea, severe diarrhea uh, side effects, which is often what ends up being the dose limiting effect or dose limiting because it just causes so many side effects. So if we can see that, okay, these individuals are more at risk of getting these side effects because their gut bacteria <laughs> are going to metabolize this and, and get more of this into the system. So those are just a couple of examples, which I think are just some good examples, though, of how the microbiome can impact responses to therapy, also side effects to therapy as well, but just tapping into that area of research. Right. It sounds like there's there's so much to explore there. It's a it's a, a complex area of, of health when you're thinking about the 38 trillion microbes, different species, we're thinking about different types of cancer, um, different types of therapy, so many different contexts to consider here. Um, you mentioned immunotherapy. Can you educate us? Um, what is immunotherapy if someone hasn't heard of that before? And how is that sort of different to, I guess, what someone may have heard more commonly, um, the chemotherapy? Sure. Um, and I'll give the disclaimer, I'm not an oncologist or cancer biologist, but I can give a pretty broad overview um, of immunotherapy is essentially using the body's own immune system to attack cancer cells. And immunotherapy, there are different types of immunotherapy. Uh, and I'll just explain the one that I gave the example of, of what's used often in melanoma. Um, our T cells have uh, PD-1, and it can bind to PDL1, which is on normal healthy cells, but also cancer cells can express this. And I kind of think of it like a handshake. So if PD1 connects with PDL1 on a cell, it's like, okay, you're, you belong here. You're cool. I'm not going to launch an immune attack on you. And where that becomes bad is if the cancer cells are able to have that handshake with the T cells and say, no, I'm cool. I belong here. And then they are evading the immune system. So one type of immunotherapy are antibodies that can bind to either PD-1 or PDL one so that that handshake can't happen. Right? And so the immune cell can recognize this cancer cell as foreign and launch the immune system to attack it. Unfortunately, a common side effect of these immunotherapies is that um, we can get some autoimmune related side effects. Right? That uh, the immune system now is too active and not recognizing what's a healthy cell or not and can start attacking its own cells. Uh, and that's different. So a little more targeted than what we see, for example, with chemotherapy, this systemic therapy, uh, there's a variety of agents that are used, but essentially it is um, targeting rapidly dividing cells. So rapidly dividing cells are going to incorporate more of this chemotherapeutic agent. Um, it damages the cells. These cancer cells don't have great repair mechanisms in place, so they die. But unfortunately, a lot of healthy cells, uh, there's a lot of collateral damage that happens as well. So when we think of some of the more common 
uh, side effects of chemotherapy are those rapidly dividing cells get impacted. Hair, skin, nails, a GI tract, the uh, red blood cells, white blood cells. So we see more systemic uh, side effects from something like chemotherapy. Right. It's a little more in, indiscriminatory. Um, so coming back to the the kind of the nutrition side of things and what we've been describing so far. So um, your, I guess, approach and philosophy here, which I'm assuming is very consistent with what the guidelines are for nutrition during um, cancer treatment, knowing all of your material that you put out and the work that you've done, um, is that people should um, – Make sure they're getting enough calories, energy. Uh, they're hitting their their protein target. They're exposing themselves to phytochemicals and fiber in a sort of plant rich, plant forward style diet. There is room in there for animal protein if they wish. Which brings me to this idea of, I think some people take the position that there can't be any animal protein in the diet at all and that a let's say 100 percent vegan diet is the best diet for someone with cancer and something i've been trying to educate the community on um in my book and just in in interviewing people is that it's not that simple <laughs> when you look at lots of different diseases um whether it's cardiovascular disease or dementia we see trends and themes broad themes but it's it's very difficult to make a claim that a plant exclusive diet is um, significantly better than a plant predominant plant rich diet. Is that the the kind of way that you approach this and and communicate it to people? Yeah, absolutely. I like to describe it as plant forward because often people think plant based means vegan, uh, but really try to educate about this. I understand. If someone is vegan and has issues with eating animal protein, this is not the time to like force and, and change um, their beliefs. But if someone is kind of mixed about this and confused about this, listen, this is for the short period of time to help your body. And the best way that you can help your body is getting adequate protein. And it is going to be very challenging if we place a lot of limitations about where you can get that protein. And an unfortunate thing about you know, plant-based foods, yes, very good sources of protein in some of these plant foods, but they're also very filling. And so it's really challenging to eat enough food to get your calories and your protein from just vegan sources of protein. So as you said, like this is a disease and a condition and we've got to use everything in our toolbox to help support your body. When this is done, yeah, we, you can eliminate animal products. We can get adequate protein. Your protein needs are not going to be as high, but this is a time that we can get the most bang for your bite. I, I use that term a lot, the most bang for your bite. You got a limited appetite. We need to have as much variety in your diet as possible so that we have a variety of foods to choose from. Um, because often I see like people are ready. Uh, actually, I find that red meat is one that a lot of people have uh, struggles with during treatment anyway, that it tastes more metallic to them. Taste changes uh, actually do already impact their ability to eat a lot of animal protein. In terms of Choosing foods at a grocery store, something that, that comes to mind for me here is organic versus conventional. Um, and particularly when we're thinking about plant foods, um, I think there's a lot said about herbicides and pesticides. And um, I'm wondering, during cancer treatment, is thinking about organic versus conventional an important consideration for, for someone? I think already a major challenge is even getting enough fruits and vegetables in the diet. Uh, but some education that I provide here for people who are worried about exposure to pesticides, herbicides um, in their product is that at least here in the U.S., there is good monitoring of pesticides and pesticide residues. Uh, in a recent report from our U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, which surveyed, oh my gosh, there's over 9,600 um, samples and over 92% of them were conventionally grown. So we're not organic. A third of them had no detectable residue in them. And 99 point, over 99.5% of them um, had levels that were below the EPA limit. 
So some education there. It's like, I understand your concern. You don't want it on your, your products. But when we look at and surveillance of our food system, there's actually very little pesticide residues on many foods. It seems that, that sometimes the importance of, of dose is is often overlooked when we're talking about or someone online is talking about a quote unquote sort of chemical or a, a compound and the fact that it's in or on a food means that that food is toxic that that's a bit of a leap to to make and organic does not mean they're not using pesticides or herbicides or fungicides there is just a certain type that is allowed to be used on them and in that USDA monitoring, uh, they are not testing yet for organic pesticide residues. So who's to say that there's also not significant residue on that? Sometimes they have to use more because they're not as effective as synthetic uh, pesticides. And again, just want to emphasize the importance of, that's why I really emphasize variety instead of saying you have to get broccoli every single day, like exposing your body to a variety of fruits and vegetables, then you are limiting your exposure to you know, the pesticide that is used on broccoli, for example, that you're having a variety of different foods in your diet. What do you think about the dirty dozen and the, the clean 15 from EWG? I've been sent this, I don't know how many times over the years. I've even had families and friends send it to me. I think from a marketing point of view, it's particularly compelling. I can understand if you are not someone who's thinking about um, dose and toxicology and looking at the analysis and how, how this has been put together and who's put it together. I think you could look at that and just very quickly at face value, accept it and be left thinking, well, this dirty dozen, I cannot buy these foods unless they are organic. That working group, what they're using to create that list is actually that USDA uh, monitoring. Right? So they are using that data that I just said shows that, wow, most a third of the foods have no detectable pesticides and the majority are below the pesticide residue uh, limits. They're using that information to create this list. And they even state it very clearly that this is not about dose. All they're doing in creating that list is the number of detectable pesticide residues on those foods. So it is not in regards to dose. Like I said, in that monitoring, nine, over 99.5% of those foods sampled had residues below the EPA limit. So sure, it might have several residues, but they were all well below the limit set by our EPA. Uh, and I'll admit, like, I didn't understand that list. And for a while, I was someone who was talking about it, but I learned more about it and also learned a little bit more about this organization. And uh, yes, it is a little bit of fear mongering. And I also see that people are avoiding and then become concerned because organic is so much more expensive and also harder to find um, some of these. So when we think about, and I think actually Australia has a similar uh, statistic that only one in 10 Americans are actually meeting the recommendations for fruits and vegetables. So I'm less concerned about the residues and more concerned that most people are not even really eating fruits and vegetables in their diet. Right. So, so that EWG, I'm kind of trying to put this together. Um, if they're just reporting the, 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 the mere fact that these uh, conventional foods had some sort of herbicide or pesticide on them and they're not considering the dose and whether that is above or below a sort of safe, acceptable limit and they're just merely pointing it out the fact that, that these pesticides and herbicides are on these fruits and vegetables. Um, what's, what is their primary intention here? Um, because as you said, if you go back and, and look at the actual exposure level, and then you look at the fact that most people are not consuming enough fruits and vegetables, it's quite clear that really people should just be encouraged to eat fruits and vegetables across the board. Um, are they, is, is there intention you know, purely to drive sales of organic produce? From my understanding, there is some funding from more organic types of, of organizations or, or farmers. So I don't know the whole backstory behind it, but I feel like now that I know more about that list, um, that kind of loses credibility for me in the way that it's discussed and, and not as clearly outlined about what that list really 
means. And what might have been more helpful is, okay, so strawberries, they're number one on that uh, dirty dozen. How much pesticide residue is on organic strawberries? That would be very informative for people to know that, okay, well, if I avoid this because this has more number of pesticide residues, um, how does that compare if I purchased organic? And then they can make a decision rather than just kind of fear mongering with this list. Of, like, These are dirty. And I hate that word too. <laughs> They're using it's dirty dozen. Um, there's pesticide residues actually on every single food that's on that list. And there's no consideration for the dose. Okay. So lots of fruits and vegetables, diversity, conventional or, or not, good to, to include. Are there any foods or beverages that you would encourage people to limit during cancer treatment? Oh, yeah. Number one, alcohol. <laughs> um, and I have to say that there are people who want to still consume some. It's like really, again, back to how much that liver is working. It's just not worth it to, to make it have to handle that. Um, really don't find that there's going to be much nutritional benefit from using sugar sweetened beverages, um, including those in the diet. Those are definitely beverages I'd recommend limiting alcohol, sugar sweetened beverages. Um, I don't say broad strokes, no juice. Sometimes um, some people have a lot of challenges with high fiber foods, depending on their cancer type, and juice could be a way to get some of those benefits of fruits and vegetables without having all that fiber. They have to be on a low fiber diet. Um, and you don't need alkaline water. <laughs> alkaline water is not going to change the pH of your body. Uh, definitely see a lot of that, that it's getting expensive, that they're trying to buy all, all their water to be alkaline water. Uh, definitely don't need that. But alcohol for sure is just not worth it. And sugar sweetened beverages are just not getting good nutrition out of, out of that. Okay. Save the money on the alkaline water and use that <laughs> for more berries because so, uh, uh, at least over in Australia, berries can can uh, be fairly expensive depending where you're going. Um, what do you think – you mentioned sugar there. I want to know what the story is with sugar. This is a big one. So what do you think about the idea that, well, if you have cancer, you should – flat out restrict carbohydrates or sugar to selectively starve those cancer cells? Unfortunately, we cannot selectively starve cancer cells. Um, and this is and one of these things I call a half truth that yes, there is a high reliance of glucose in cancer cells. They are using um, anaerobic glycolysis or aerobic glycolysis generating uh, energy very quickly and also need to generate things for their DNA, RNA synthesis. So they do have high demand for glucose. But there are also other cells in the body that have a pretty high demand for glucose, including the brain and also those red blood cells that are transporting oxygen everywhere in the body. And unfortunately, by restricting um, carbohydrates from the diet, the body by the body, the liver is going to have to make that glucose. <laughs> Why are we putting more work on the liver? It's the most hardworking organ in the body uh, to make it then start making glucose so that the other cells in the body can get that glucose if you're not getting it in from the diet. And then to add even more complexity to this, we also know that uh, many cancer cells have a high reliance for the amino acid glutamine. And there's been studies where they've tried to inhibit this pathway of um, glutamine metabolism and the cancer cells just can use a different pathway and actually become more reliant on glucose uh, to feed through that TCA cycle. So just showing that when you try to do like one thing and manipulating uh, the fuel source for cancer, it's like, okay, then we'll just go this way to try to get energy and that there can be resistance uh, to that. And then my other big concern with when people are trying to restrict carbohydrates for fear of glucose is we talked about all the benefits of carbohydrate containing foods, the phytochemicals and fruits and vegetables, the fiber that supports the microbiome that uh, may have a role in your immune system being able to also be a part of this cancer fight. So by restricting carbohydrates, you are also limiting fiber, nutrients, phytochemicals, and you're not setting your body up in the best way possible. I do get a lot, well, there's some ketogenic diet uh, research. The clinical trials are so small and have not really shown any consistent benefit. So I don't think that the clinical research out there in relation to the ketogenic diet and broadly speaking cancer um, 
is enough to support restricting carbohydrates from the diet. How pervasive or powerful, impactful do you think that carbohydrate restriction sort of starving cancer cell story is like are you seeing patients people come to you that for example are are fearful of eating fruit oh yeah absolutely avoiding fruit in their diet no grains in their diet um, only choosing low glycemic index vegetables uh, so no starchy vegetables and so they've cut out a lot of foods from their diet it is very pervasive even if someone is not following a ketogenic diet I find that many have um, heard enough about this sugar feeds cancer that they have made a lot of restrictions in their diet because of it. You mentioned uh, cachexia earlier, and and you're also talking about the importance of preserving muscle. Um, Another sort of... um, tool or potential intervention that's that's thrown out there uh, for um, as an adjunct or a consideration during cancer treatment is this idea of fasting. And in many ways, there's a bit of overlap here, I think, with the ketogenic diet and kind of this idea of starving, um, starving cells, cancer cells. It, it would seem to me at a, at a a high level here, just thinking about the importance of of avoiding unintentional weight loss and muscle loss, that 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 would need to be really balanced with with fasting. Is that your view? And is there any potential benefits of yes, having some sort of fasting protocol, but still making sure that you're getting enough protein and energy? Yeah. So there is. Um, I know many clinical trials undergoing now looking at fasting or fasting mimicking diet. Uh, there has been some published clinical trials, but with small samples and, and quite diverse samples. And say one of the largest ones was uh, in breast cancer, right, which is a population maybe not at as high risk of malnutrition as say pancreatic cancer. So I think there might be some populations that it is worth studying because they're at lower risk of malnutrition. I think to put someone on five days of 300 calories that has pancreatic cancer, that that sounds very risky um, for me. And do we really have, yes, there's a little bit of research on it might reduce the severity of some side effects for their chemo. I want to see survival outcomes, but that, that's, that's very different. And so is it really worth the, okay, their nausea wasn't as severe, but you put them through that and it didn't actually benefit any survival outcomes or uh, response to therapy outcomes. So I think it's, it, I'm paying attention to it. I'm not throwing it all out. I'm, I'm watching that research, but right now I think it's too early. There's a lot of little small studies and back to that example of that breast cancer, uh, that study done in individuals breast cancer, um, only 50% completed two cycles of that fasting mimicking diet, only 50%. So that just shows like a really big barrier is going to be, can people even do it? Um, Why well, put them through this? They can't, can't do it. It's difficult. And we're looking at, again, a population that is not at very high risk of malnutrition and still found it very challenging to even do two cycles of this fasting. Yeah, it's a, it's a, just another example of of where something may have therapeutic utility and on paper may seem really beneficial, but until you've tested it, until you see whether there is people are able to adhere to it, until you see what are the unintended consequences, it's very hard to make a kind of risk uh, reward call. On, on whether that's something that you want to do as an individual or whether you want to recommend it, put in the guidelines, um, all of that sort of stuff. We haven't spoken much about hormones. If if someone has a sort of hormone-dependent cancer, let's say an estrogen-dependent cancer, and they're wondering, are there any particular aspects of their diet that they should consider more closely? Are there any foods to avoid or to eat more of that that could affect estrogen and their overall, I guess, um, health outcomes? Ooh, yes, another plug for fiber. And the benefit of fiber has been associated with uh, lower estrogen levels and its role in helping with elimination through the uh, GI tract. So that would be definitely a food to focus on. I often, this myth is still going around about soy not being safe for those with a hormone dependent cancer. Unfortunately, still many oncologists are repeating this misinformation. Um, 
because soy has isoflavones, which have a similar structure to estrogen. The concern is that they could bind to an estrogen receptor and, and stimulate growth. That has not been shown with foods and soy foods have actually, in some cases, been associated with reduced risk of breast cancer, for example. So I'd like to emphasize fiber. But also if we're looking at someone in like survivorship phase, focusing a little bit more on weight management. So we do know that those adipose cells can also make estrogen. So people to worry less about maybe potential estrogen in the, in the food, if they have fears about that. It's like the biggest estrogen amount is going to be coming from your body and, and that internal uh, production of it. So looking at ways that you can help with the elimination, okay, supporting liver function, natural detoxification activities, no detox things, but you know, fiber or those cruciferous vegetables and um, weight management, physical activity uh, as part of that as well is what I like to focus on. Are there any supplements at all that you think, I mean, let's let's put aside specific supplements to plug a gap or a nutrient deficiency because clearly there could be some, some clinical utility there if someone's just not getting something in their diet and they can take a supplement to restore or get them to a healthy level, but put that to the side. There's so many herbs and different types of uh, formulas out there um, outside of sort of essential micronutrients that are claiming to have you know certain benefits whether it's for the immune system or um, for energy things like that is there anything that is worth exploring that could be beneficial for a, a patient during cancer treatment oh you already said the thing about okay not replacing a micronutrient deficiency it's like well no, unfortunately, there isn't really a lot of great research. There is a little bit that has been investigated for chemotherapy uh, related peripheral neuropathy, maybe some B vitamins that's still under uh, investigation. There's only some chemotherapies that cause that neuropathy. But I am not aware of really any clinical evidence about a particular supplement that has a benefit on any type of um, type of cancer outcome. Uh, we talked about probiotics a, a little bit. Yeah, that can help with management of side effects. It's actually been shown to reduce the severity as well of mucositis, uh, those mouth sores in head and neck cancer patients. I think, um, if anything, probiotics could be beneficial in some individuals, but more for management of um, some of these common side effects. I think, again, there's just so much risk in supplements, especially during cancer treatment. So here in the U.S., supplements do not have to undergo any type of safety or purity testing before they're allowed to be sold. And that's why they are all abundant and all so easy to access. But what people don't recognize is that especially some of these herbs can interfere with the metabolism of therapeutics. And that can, again, increase the risk of side effects, could potentially reduce the efficacy of your treatment. So without that clinical evidence to support that it has benefit, why take that risk to reduce the benefit of your therapy? Uh, I, I just really don't think it's it's worth that risk. Um, but aside from, yeah, maybe a multivitamin, I always try to get patients to optimize their vitamin D levels. I, I do find pretty high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, and that actually has been reported in, in the literature, some vitamin D insufficiency. Try to get that optimized uh, during therapy. I think some of this is potentially a little bit tricky on an on an individual basis if you are diagnosed with cancer some of this can sound counterintuitive right because it might seem like the best approach is to sort of explore everything that you can and throw the kitchen sink and and more at this and do the the juice cleanses and buy all the powders for detoxification and buy the plethora of supplements and you know, people may feel guilty if they're not doing that. They may feel like they're not doing enough. So I can kind of understand on from an individual's point of view that exploring all of those and going in to, you know, um, purchasing lots of, lots of different supplements is something that they're doing with really good intentions. Absolutely. I think like they want to do everything possible, even if there is, you know, maybe one small trial showed a potential benefit in this one thing. Well, why not add this on? 
but we talked about like these supplements can add up in their cost. And is that replacing the ability to purchase healthful food and incorporate that in the diet? There's already a lot of financial toxicity associated with uh, cancer and cancer treatment. Um, it's not worth that money. Um, there's really not a lot of benefit, but I totally empathize with that. I, I see this a lot. They want to do everything and they're going to the support groups, looking up for things online to find anything that can help just kind of tip things in their favor. But unfortunately, again, with a very vulnerable population, there is a lot of marketing and misrepresentation of what that supplement could actually do for them. It, like, for example, with a mushroom, that's a very popular supplement I've, I've heard about in cancer. And so there's actually a small trial that showed that it could boost uh, immune function. But when I look at the supplements that I've often had patients show me the supplements that they're taking, it's like, well, that's not even close to the dose that was shown in that study to be beneficial. So you're paying all this money, but this is not actually even the dose shown to have any benefit. So it's probably not really doing anything at all. And that these supplements can add up. Um, I, I had one example of a patient who was spending hundreds of dollars a month on, on supplements. It really is, I get they want to grasp everything, but it's not worth it. Which is ironic given that usually the people that are making the money off of those are pointing to the pharmaceutical industry and saying how corrupt they are because they want to make money when really both sides of this equation, whether it's uh, alternative, natural or not, are are money-making, money-generating um, businesses, entities. Uh, yep, exactly. It's like those supplements aren't free. Uh, that diet book's not free. That cleanse is not free. They're not giving you these things out of the generosity of their heart. They're also making money, trying to make money. Yeah, it's a conversation I have with a, a lot of people, particularly friends and family, and it goes back to what I said earlier. It just leaves me in this position where you know, I just take the position that uh, alternative, natural, um, or intuitive or not, we have to put the, all of these things through the same scientific method and, and rigor in order to determine what's effective. We can't have one set of rules for what a pharmaceutical company does and a completely different set of rules for something just because it's alternative. I feel like claims are claims and let's, let's go through the same process and, and that way we can make the best decisions. Oh, absolutely. I love the way you explained that. And can I share an example about when a uh, therapy like that was actually put to the test? Sure. Yeah. So this was um, studied down in the late 1990s. It's called the Gonzalez Protocol. So this involved taking uh, pancreatic uh, an organ based supplements, a variety of digestive enzymes. I mean, these people were literally taking hundreds of supplements a day spread out throughout the day. And they compared this, this is for pancreatic cancer. Uh, this therapy not only involved all of these supplements, it had a very strict dietary uh, regimen, which is primarily vegan, also incorporated coffee enemas for detox. So this is an example of one that has like all the things that I hear about, the juice cleansing, the vegan diet, the supplements, the enemas, and compared it to uh, chemotherapy at that time for pancreatic cancer, gemcitabine. What they found when put to the test, the survival was median survival was about 14 months in the chemotherapy group. It was only four months in the Gonzalez protocol. Uh, they also saw a significant increase in pain, while those that were receiving chemotherapy had decrease in pain and uh, you know improvements in quality of life. Uh, and actually, this st study started as a randomized controlled trial, but people uh, were having difficulty accruing because people did not want to get randomized to the alternative therapy, actually. So people got to they changed that protocol and allowed people to self-select into uh, definitely limitations. But I don't think we'll ever see a study like this again, where we're going to compare chemotherapy to diet alone. But when this is actually put to the test, that is a significant difference in survival. And when you say we probably won't see that study, is that mainly because it would be unethical? Oh, I think it would be unethical. <laughs> I, I think it would definitely be unethical to put something um, like diet alone against chemotherapies that we know improve survival. Quick one. A lot of people ask me for tips on buying supplements and getting blood tests. I've created zero cost guides for both of these, which you can download from my website, theproof.com. I'm trying to put myself into the shoes of someone who's fighting cancer and listening to this conversation. And I can imagine that 
there's an enormous emotional toll. Um, energy levels are probably not super high. There's probably a lot of uh, appointments to juggle, new information to take on, information overload. Do you have any tips for helping people uh, eat well, incorporate some of the things that we've spoken about today um, without seeming like they have to spend hours and hours shopping and cooking and learning new recipes without sort of feeling the the potential overwhelm that could come with this? Yes, uh, many can feel very overwhelmed. And so one uh, tip that I give is to just try to simplify and not overcomplicate it. It is okay to not have different meals for all the meals every day. Try to reduce some of that decision making. They're already making a lot of decisions in their life and in their healthcare. Okay, at 8 a.m., I have breakfast and this is what I make for breakfast. To try to limit the decisions that they have to make and also the complexity of their meals. And another tip I, I like to give is to um, try to use, they need, it is okay to use canned and frozen, uh, pre-washed, pre-prepared vegetables. Not everything needs to be made from scratch. And also, if we save some money on dietary supplements, for example, we could use some of that money to purchase some of that pre-prepared uh, food or have some, there are some meal delivery services that uh, provide some healthful uh, pre-prepared meals that someone just needs to heat up or blend into a smoothie. There's also those options. And that if there are uh, friends and loved ones who want to support you, one way they could do that is by uh, supporting you in their nutrition. It gives them maybe really specific ways that someone can support you. For example, okay, Wednesday is the day I go in for my chemotherapy infusion. It's a long day. I'm exhausted. Could I ask a friend or family member, could you bring us a meal? that day. And these are the foods that I'm able to tolerate right now. Or could you pick up my grocery delivery order? That nutrition can be a way that loved ones can also come in and, and support. Unfortunately, sometimes I do hear that they're like, well, they're bringing like all these comfort foods or spice things I can't eat. Like, well, it's okay to give those uh, specific examples of what you can eat, what you do enjoy, maybe what your family also likes too, if you also are taking care of your family. Biggest tip is to simplify, don't overcomplicate it. We don't have to have variety in every day and all the meals. We do some of that decision making and just really focus on that consistency of fueling your body. That's what matters most is consistency and fueling your body. The friends and family piece gets me thinking, and I know that you'll have terrific insight here about how we as a friend or a family member can support someone that has a cancer diagnosis, that's going through cancer treatment. So based on your sort of experience in working with people and hearing lots of different stories and circumstances, how can we firstly better understand what someone's going through? And is there anything that we should be mindful of as a friend or a family member, um, whether it's do's and don'ts um, or just general things to have top of mind when speaking with someone who has cancer so that we can provide the best support possible? It's great to ask. And I don't want to necessarily speak for a cancer patients, but I will say what is often disclosed to me and, and some things that really do bother them is getting unsolicited advice whether it's a diet book or like, hey, I heard sugar feeds cancer, <laughs> you shouldn't have this. It's unsolicited advice is not helpful at all and, and can actually be very angering uh, for these individuals. Um, and also say, well, I heard of somebody that tried this or I, I get that sometimes it could be well-intentioned if people just want to help. If people want to help and think that sharing information that they know could be helpful, fortunately, it, it really is not. It's not. Um, and another thing, too, is to not put so much pressure, and this is something I work on a lot when patients uh, come in with a, a caregiver or a loved one, but this can be really a point of contention. Like they're not eating or they're not eating enough, and there can be um, a lot of discourse around food. It's like food and nutrition is already stressful enough in going through cancer treatment. Having that pressure from a loved one is not healthy in this experience and um, it's creating a lot of again discourse and not helpful in that relationship. 
And I gave that example of maybe people asking for that help. It would also be a little more helpful if people didn't wait to uh, get asked to help. Um, often people hear is like, oh, let me know if you need anything. Like, how about you just show up and say, hey, I want to make you a meal this week. What would be a best day to come, Wednesday or Friday? Uh, that might be a more helpful way. Or could I pick something up for you this week? Could I pick up your kids from school this week? Just finding ways to help with those daily tasks that are really, truly helping, not this unsolicited advice when you don't really understand cancer. I mean, even within this podcast, I can't truly really explain what it is like working in oncology and all the different uh, cancer types is just showing up for somebody. I think really it's about just showing up for someone, truly showing that you care. You don't have to fix everything going on in their life. Um, it's just about listening and just about showing up in, in small ways that can actually have a pretty big benefit for them. And uh, yeah, so not to just kind of speak on all those things, but I think one of the most helpful ways is just to show up and, and show that you care and you're willing to listen. And it, it's not about again, trying to offer books. Oh, and one big thing, the coloring books. People don't want more coloring books. <laughs> I laugh about that because that is like a common gift that people give somebody. It's like enough with the coloring books. Uh, what would maybe be more helpful is, hey, maybe a $25 gift card to the grocery store so I can get some, some food. Uh, that's going to be more helpful than another coloring book or a diet book or a supplement that you heard. Just show up. Just show up for that person. And if if that person is is listening um, someone with cancer and is wanting to learn more. They're they're wanting to find some sort of guidelines or reputable resource where it delves into it, things that we've discussed today and and possibly more. Or they're wanting to find someone they can work with, uh, a dietitian or some sort of practitioner that can help provide them with. Um, with advice that is supported by the best evidence that we have, where can we kind of direct that person? Sure. One of my favorite resources is the American Institute for Cancer Research. You're also part of the World Cancer Research Fund. They have a lot of great consumer-friendly resources about cancer, about nutrition and cancer. They're a great resource. Um, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, I really it's not just for blood cancers. They actually have a lot of great nutrition uh, resources on their website, including they do have some free support for nutrition uh, support. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, we do have our professional organization, um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and there is a way that you can search for a board-certified uh, oncology dietitian. Say, so I'm not sure about other resources in, in other countries, how to find a dietitian that specializes in that area. But I think it is important to understand that you should be working with somebody that does understand cancer. Uh, not all dietitians are going to be proficient in the different cancer therapies and the different challenges of cancer. So going to a dietitian that works in weight management, uh, it's not going to be your best resource. Same thing with like working with personal trainers. Hopefully there's someone, there are actually certifications in uh, cancer uh, exercise or working with a physical therapist that has uh, specialty training and working with individuals with cancer. Really, it's looking for that specialty because we, we tapped into a little bit of that today about the differences between what's going on in cancer and, and other uh, healthy individuals. So really investing that time into finding someone that is more specialized. But my biggest tip is, yeah, American Institute for Cancer Research is, is my favorite resource. It's evidence-based and also very work, uh, much more consumer-friendly resource. Lastly here, leave us with something interesting about pomegranate from your research or, <laughs> oh or gosh, just, that was like, just as a food in general. <laughs> pitch, six, pitch, uh, give, us the, give us the elevator pitch for pomegranate. Oh my gosh, that was like 16 years ago. Now you're making me feel old about when I did that <laughs> research. <laughs> um, actually, I think it's more exciting. It's like we started off, I'll say something interesting. Like I feel like the nutrition and cancer research did kind of start off with looking at isolated compounds and what this isolated compound could do to this specific cancer cells. And it moved on to looking at different foods and what they could do. Actually, my PhD research was on using dietary interventions, whole foods. But now we're looking bigger picture here. What about dietary patterns because people aren't just eating individual compounds or individual foods. We're looking at dietary patterns. 
And so uh, really, I think the most interesting thing here is that a lot more evidence that is um, supporting the health benefits of a plant-based, plant-forward diet. We look at the American Institute for Cancer Research, cancer prevention recommendations, you know, eating more whole grains, eating fruits and vegetables, limiting processed foods, the fo limiting red and processed meats. And the focus here is plants and try to get as many of those in your diet. So yeah, pomegranate's great. It had ellagic uh, acid is the compound that we studied there, but there is beyond that now where our nutrition science research is now looking more at foods and patterns. All right. Well, thanks for clar clarifying that. I think <laughs> otherwise we might have seen the, the, the pomegranate juice cleanse. Oh, I know, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Crystal, um, this has been super, super interesting. It's incredible information that I really do hope gets into the, the people's hands who, who need it. So thank you so much for doing everything that you do and taking on misinformation and bringing clarity to such a, an enormously important topic. I really value uh, everything that you're doing. If folks would like to connect with you online um, and just learn more about what you have to say, where can they find you? Yeah, um, cancernutritionhq.com. And I'm also on Instagram at cancernutritionhq. Really, my goal is to try to bust some of that misinformation while also sharing all the uh, new and exciting research that is coming out. And so I really appreciate you also investing in uh, discussing this topic, because it really is not discussed enough on these types of platforms. So I appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure. And I'll put a link to uh, the website, your socials, and some of those other resources that you uh, mentioned earlier into the show notes for people to explore in their own time. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. There we go, friends. Thank you for showing up and the effort you're making to take better control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again next week for another episode.